I wanted to talk about an article that just came out February 16th, 2023, because it's in line of what I've been saying about that Israel is trying to recreate the ancient monarchy and put in place an earthly king and restore the monarchy of Israel. This is what Daniel the prophet saw in the future. And recently the Lord had revealed it to me from the book of Revelation. So this is an opinion piece by Douglas Bloomfield in the Jerusalem Post. And he just said, Israel is a tough sell in the U.S. as it slides towards autocracy. So let me just tell you what autocracy is referring to here. And it says this, that forms of existence, monarchy has many forms, such as hereditary monarchy, elective monarchy, and constitutional monarchy. Autocracy is an absolute monarchy that mostly operates as a dictatorship. So this article is verifying what I've been telling you, that they are setting up the ancient monarchy of Israel, and they want to put the Supreme Court in the hands of the Sanhedrin eventually and have them be the world court. The one world religion will be there in Jerusalem with the king that they appoint. And this is a very interesting difference between autocracy and monarchy. So you've got to hear this and then I'll tell you about the article and what it says. But it says both autocracy and monarchy are similar ruling systems with some differences between them. Monarchy refers to a ruling system whereas the power and the sole authority of the nation lay in one or two individuals hands. These individuals who entertain the fullest power are were called the monarchs. Autocracy on the other hand refers to another form of monarchy where the sole power rests in one individual's hands and he or she has few or no legal restrictions. Let us look at the terms autocracy and monarchy and the differences between them in detail. What is monarchy? Monarchy, as mentioned above, is the ruling system where the ruling of a nation relies on one or two individuals' hands. The right of decision-making, ruling, and all other things regarding the particular nation may be done by the monarch. There is no form of democracy and the participation of the general public in decision-making process is very little to none. Monarchies may exist until the death of the emperor or a case of abdication. A monarch may come into power as a result of heredity. It's one of the type of monarchies. Hereditary monarchies are subject to the requirements like religion abilities and gender, etc. The role of the monarch changes from one society to another. In one nation, he or she may be a tyrant, whereas in another, people may worship him or her taking as a divine king. So do you see when they build the third temple, this king that they appoint is going to sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God and people may worship him taking him as a divine king. This is part of hereditary monarchies. If they think King Charles III is in the lineage of King David and Solomon as it says in their genealogical line for King Charles III then he would rightfully take that seat and they could worship him taking him as a divine king. It all fits into place. However, monarchies rarely exist today and those who still practice these are an elective type of monarchy. There the monarch is selected by a voting system. So see Israel could vote through the Sanhedrin who appoints the king to elect to have King Charles III be their king through a voting system through the Sanhedrin which is the judicial system of Israel. Ultimately they want to be the supreme court of the entire world. 
Monarchy has enjoyed a lot of power in the past, and there has been good and bad, as well as monarchs throughout the world. What is autocracy? Autocracy is the type of ruling system where the whole power and authority of a nation rests in one person's hand. This is also called an absolute monarchy. In an autocracy, the ruler does not have legal restrictions or political barriers. He or she can have the power to make any decision on his or her own. Autocracy may exist as a dictatorship and the emperor would not consider the ideas of the public. So there would be no voting rights, there would be no concern about what people want. This is what's happening with the ultra-Orthodox trying to pass this law that criminalizes the women having a Torah scroll at the Western Wall to read, or blowing a shofar there, playing music there, wearing phylacteries or a prayer shawl. They would be criminalized and thrown in jail for six months with a fine of 10,000 shekels. Since the absolute monarchs have full authority over the state and government, they have the freedom to make laws, impose rules, and punish the people who go against the rules. And Benjamin Netanyahu has recently said that he would crack down on the opposition. However, absolute monarchs had not always been authoritarians. There had been some autocrats who have allowed freedom in many ways during the Enlightenment era. Moreover, autocratic leaders may come into the power as a result of inheritance. The kingship may pass from one generation to another, too. However, there are no more autocracies in the current world. So, the difference between autocracy and monarchy, by definition, monarchy is the ruling system where the authority lies in the hands of one or two individuals or royal family. So, you could have the prime minister ruling and the president ruling with um, the monarch. In an autocracy, the sole power and authority is in one person's hands and there are less or no legal or political restrictions. Monarchies may come into power as a result of generation and also there can be elective monarchs who have been selected through a voting system. So that would be through the Sanhedrin placing King Charles III as their king, sitting upon the Stone of Schoon, which is Jacob's pillow stone, as he's coronated and given power and authority in his crown, scepter, and rod, and sword to rule the people. Autocrats may come into power as, as a result of hereditary relations, and there are no voting systems or concerns over the interests of the general public. So basically, the people lose their rights the king has all the power to do any and implement any rules or laws that he deems should go into place. Absolute monarchy is a form of monarchy in which the monarch rules in their own right or power. In an absolute monarchy, the king or queen is by no means limited and has absolute power. Though a limited constitution may exist in some countries, these are often hereditary monarchies. On the other hand, in constitutional monarchies, in which the authority of the head of state is also bound or restricted by the constitution, a legislature, or unwritten customs, the king or queen is not the only one to decide and their entourage also exercises power, mainly the prime minister. So, if they had a parliamentary monarchy set up in Israel eventually, then they would have the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, stay in his position as prime minister, and the president, Isaac Herzog, would stay president, and they would have a parliament, and the king would be the head of state, the absolute ruler. In the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan wielded absolute power over the state and was considered a padisha, meaning great king, by his people. Many Sultans wielded absolute power 
through heavenly mandates reflected in their titles such as shadow of God on earth. In ancient Mesopotamia many rulers of Assyria, Babylonia, and Sumer were absolute monarchies as well. Many nations formerly with absolute monarchies such as Jordan, Kuwait, and Morocco have moved towards constitutional monarchies. However, in these cases, the monarch still retains tremendous power even to the extent that by some measures, Parliament's influence on political life is viewed as negligible. So it's really interesting to me that this article just came out February 16th. Israel is a tough sell in the U.S. as it slides towards autocracy. The Prime Minister insists his approach would make Israel more democratic, but the evidence points emphatically in the opposite direction. Morris J. Amnite, the former executive director of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, was eulogized this week for his passionate, energetic, and successful leadership that raised IPAC to national prominence as one of the most influential voices on Middle East policy in Washington. His favorite pitch, said his son Steve in a eulogy at Washington's historic sixth and first synagogue, was to emphasize that Israel is a true democracy in a sea of autocrats. Maury didn't invent that line, but he honed it and employed it effectively as have those who followed him. I was one of those he hired and trained. We didn't always agree on policy. He was hawkish. I'm dovish. But we had common cause in promoting U.S.-Israeli friendship. He preached and practiced bipartisanship, expanding support for Israel into Republican ranks, shared democratic values, was a critical selling point. World leaders speak out. Netanyahu and his government need to back down from judicial reform. In a series of unprecedented moves, the presidents of Israel, the U.S., and France have spoken out separately in recent days, urging Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to step back from the precipice. The same message is being sent by hundreds of thousands of Israelis protesting their government's plans to overhaul the nation's judicial systems. The President Joe Biden, his decision to go public suggests he felt repeated personal messages from his Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and other top officials were not being taken seriously by the Prime Minister. The President's history as Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee brings added weight to his concerns about the developments in Israel and coupled with a long-standing affinity for Israel that comes from the Kishkis as well as the mind. Biden, in a message to New York Times colonist Tom Friedman, stressed the fundamental importance of an independent judiciary and checks and balances for countries like Israel and the U.S. Friedman noted that it was the first time to a, his knowledge that an American president has ever weighed in on an internal Israel debate and the nature of its democracy. President Isaac Herzog, in an Unprecedented primetime speech to the nation warned that the assault on the basic principles of democracy and an independent judiciary has increasingly divided the country and put it on the brink of constitutional and social collapse, calling on the government to pause its rush to pass its judicial makeover, he warned. This powder keg is about to explode. This is an emergency. That was a quote from President Isaac Herzog. It says Netanyahu and his extremist coalition appear hell bent on rushing ahead in defiance of public and international cause to slow it down and seek a national consensus. He and his Knesset allies appear prepared to sacrifice democracy in favor of power. And that's what I told you. That's what he's trying to do, is set it up to hand over the keys to the king that they appoint for the monarchy to be restored. And with the Sanhedrin appointing that king as the supreme judiciary and 
replacing what they the system that they have now. Okay, so the Prime Minister insists his approach would make Israel more democratic, but as I said, the evidence points emphatically in the opposite direction. Alan Pincus, former Israeli Consul General in New York, said that Netanyahu proposal is a swift, brutal, and illegitimate attempt to change the regime, curtail civil liberties, deny the Supreme Court its judicial review powers, weaken checks and balances, destroy constitutional guardrails, and control the media and academia through constant harassment. For Netanyahu, it's also personal. These changes, reforms, are a misnomer, are Netanyahu's get-out-of-jail-free card, thanks to provisions that would effectively squash the criminal charges of fraud, bribery, and breach of trust for which he's currently on trial and grant him future immunity. Former Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit, who had indicted Netanyahu for these crimes, said in a recent interview that the Prime Minister's motivation is to nullify his trial. Zippy Livni, former Justice Minister and Foreign Minister, has said Netanyahu's personal intent is to delegitimize the judicial system. But see, he has to do that in order to hand the keys over to the monarch that's coming. Because that's in prophecy in the book of Revelation that the king is going to be appointed. The Israel Policy Forum, a center-left American Jewish organization promoting a two-state solution, called this a watershed moment in diaspora Israel relations. Abe Foxman, the former head of the Anti-Defamation League, said Itamar ben Gvir and Bezalel Shmotrich, two of Israel's most far-right ministers, don't have any respect for diaspora Jewry, and that American Jewish organizations should refuse to meet with them or give them a platform. Because basically they want to put an end to people being able to make Aliyah and come back to Israel. They want to, you know, put an end to the diaspora. A growing number of American Jewish leaders and supporters of Israel in Congress, notably Jewish lawmakers, have been going public in their concerns about the threat to Israeli democracy posed by Netanyahu's so-called judicial reforms. The latest is Senator Richard Durbin, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the chamber's second highest ranking Democrat. He told Haaretz that the Israeli leader is dangerously putting his own narrow political and legal interests in those of the troubling extremists in his coalition ahead of the long-term interests and needs of Israel's democracy. Exacerbating the growing crisis and further straining relations with the Biden administration was this week's announcement by Netanyahu's office of the intent to build 10,000 new settler homes in the Judea and Samaria and convert nine illegal West Bank outposts to legitimate settlements. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was joined by the foreign ministers of France, Germany, Italy, and Britain in condemning the expansion plan. The Senate Department also warned against transferring military authority in the West Bank to extremist finance minister Schmotrich, which U.S. officials would consider a step towards annexation, a step the U.S. and much of the international community oppose as an obstacle to efforts to negotiate a two-state solution. That just happens to be Netanyahu's goal. It is going to be a tough sell for pro-Israel lobbyists, a group that achieved great political clout thanks to the bipartisanship and focus on democracy of Maury Amite and pro-Israel leaders from the grassroots to Capitol Hill. So as I told you, I saw in Revelation 13 that Israel has restored the monarchy their monarchy was the one that had the deadly wound by a sword and yet lived. And as soon as, you know, Israel became a nation, now they're going to restore the ancient monarchy. That deadly wound in the head, the head of state, is healed. And they place a new king, an earthly king, on the throne who's just a man, who they say is the anointed one, who is an appointed king by the Sanhedrin that is voted in. And this is exactly what an autocracy 
has been stated to be. And I think the most telling of all that the Antichrist is going to sit in the third temple and proclaim himself to be God is because he's a king and he is sitting on the stone of Schoon, which is Jacob's pillow stone that's anointed, that all the monarchs have been coronated upon. And he's going to be seen as the rightful heir to the throne, as having the genealogical line of King David and King Solomon, which King Charles III does claim. And he's also knighted Rabbi Ephraim Mervis into Sir Ephraim Mervis, and he's going to be spending the night at Clarence House the night before King Charles III takes the power and authority of the throne at his coronation ceremony. But I think the thing that just gets me the most is this sentence that the role of the monarch changes from one society to another. In one nation, he or she may be a tyrant, whereas in another, people may worship him, taking him as a divine king. That is what I see absolutely happening when the king, that's the Antichrist, sits in the third temple proclaiming himself to be God because, you see, King Solomon had said he was not only sitting on his father's throne, David's throne, it was considered the throne of the Lord. So he, when he becomes king, sits on the stone of Schoon, which is Jacob's pillow stone, he could say, basically, the people may worship him, taking him as a divine king. And that's how it's all going to come down. And this article in J. Post just verified that Israel is sliding towards autocracy. Exactly what I've been telling you for the last couple of months, that they are setting up the monarchy to hand, for Netanyahu to hand the keys to the king that they're going to appoint. And it's going to be somebody who is in line of the throne. And King Charles III best fits that definition. So this is really unprecedented to have this article just come out that Israel is sliding towards autocracy. So now you can understand the passage where he's trying to force the people to worship him as their divine king, as the Antichrist sitting upon the throne of God in the temple of God proclaiming that he is God. You can see exactly how it's going to fall into place from this. And if you really want to read all about the true king that's coming, Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, please read the Almond Tree, Eretz Rod, the Messiah, King of Israel, and it's available at olivepresspublisher.com. And I just hope that you can see how all of this is basically what's in the book of Revelation is in the definitions of autocracy and monarchy and how it's all going to come together. It's absolutely unbelievable that the people could worship him because he is appointed as their divine king. And he doesn't have to take the seat with hereditary means necessarily. He can be voted in by the Sanhedrin. It was the Sanhedrin that was responsible for appointing the king. And that's what's going to happen. As I've told you, the prophet Daniel basically told us that a beast is a king. So if a beast is a king, and the king is the authority over the people, now with that understanding, knowing that in a hereditary monarchy or an autocracy, that people may worship him, taking him as a divine king, we can now understand this verse in Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Another interpretation is all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, 
The beast is a king in the kingdom that he rules. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life of the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So worshiping the beast, you're worshiping the king, you're worshiping that man as a divine king. And you're subservient to him because he rules over you. And he will impose all of his rules as an absolute monarch, including that you take his royal cipher mark, which is the mark of the king, the beast. So don't ever take it. Don't ever, ever take it in your right hand or forehead because you belong to the Lamb. If you've given your life to the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. And with that, I'll say, wow, how incredible that this all is very understandable now and really clearly um, I'm trying to show you how it all lines up like this. So many generations of people had no clue what this meant. But I'm trying to reveal the things that the Lord is showing me about it and putting them in there, showing you with the scriptures. So you can see how it all falls into place. Israel certainly is sliding towards the monarchy, the autocracy, and appointing a king through the Sanhedrin. This is why the democracy is being weakened and the judicial systems being weakened so they can put this in place and restore the monarchy. And therefore, the deadly wound by a sword will be healed when this king takes the throne. But then the Lord Jesus is going to come and bring and open Daniel's scroll and bring forth the judgments and the wrath of God. And he's going to return and set up his kingdom. This is how it's going to go down, people. I hope you can see it. And I hope that God still uses me to show the things that he's revealed to me to you. Till next time, I'll just say, I hope this... Uh, enlightened you somewhat and you can see what's coming to pass before our eyes and with the ultra-orthodox rules that they want to put in place the king could absolutely do as he pleases and put that in place so that women would be criminalized so anyway please support my channel and thank you for watching God bless you my um, links are paypal.me slash K-K-R-O-C-O-C-O -O -O, and the address is Kimberly Ballard B-A-L-L-A-R-D P.O. Box 246 Niwot N-I-W-O-T Colorado 80544 We've been under a winter weather advisory all day and now this evening and tonight we're expecting to get to 7 degrees so it's a pretty cold night. I just wanted to get something um, recorded for you this evening. I had problems with recording on my phone earlier. So I had to redo it on my camera. Well, have a good evening. I'll talk to you in the next video. Shalom for now and good night.